So we will now close this section by calling on stage Norman Spector. Uh, Norman uh, keeps his body in uh, Victoria on Vancouver Island, uh, where I met him again in the course of uh, building our uh, new station out there, uh, the new VI. I say again because we both grew up in Montreal, went to school uh, at McGill, um, then I veered off into the sinful paths of show business and television, and uh, Norman concerned himself with the serious stuff. Uh, government, politics, media. He uh, writes columns and he has a Rolodex to beat the band, Norman Spector. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want anybody to think that Moses and I were at McGill at the same time. Uh, the good news this morning is that uh, I know nothing about Afghanistan and won't talk about it. Moses, no wonder people who reminisce about this conference all talk about the parties. This has been pretty gloomy, uh, but you ain't heard nothing yet, because uh, the area that I'm always asked about in relation to September 11th uh, is the Mideast. Prior to September 11th, of course, uh, People would always know, uh, would always ask me how one gets to be an ambassador in the Mideast. And I would never answer the question, but this has been such a gloomy session that I, I'm going to share it with you because I know that it won't get out of this room. <laughs> and uh, as I look, as I look at the audience, uh, and uh, you'll shut down the cameras now too, right, Moses? As I look at the audience, I, I can see a number of future ambassadors out there. In any case, the story is told of uh, John F. Kennedy uh, when he was running for the presidency in the late 50s. And, you know, it's hard to remember, but uh, he actually was a long shot, uh, both because of his religion and also uh, because he, he was a congressman. He came out of the House of Representatives, uh, which was not the uh, traditional route to power. And even though he came from a very wealthy family, he was uh, strapped for campaign funds. And the strategy that they adopted was uh, that each of the staff would uh, double up uh, on their uh, functions. Well, one day they landed at O'Hare in a driving blizzard. And he waited, uh, he waited for the uh, press and the uh, campaign staff to disembark. He got off the back. And he's walking uh, downtown. He runs across uh, Evans and Novak. The colonists, and they stop him and they say, uh, you know, we've been meaning to ask you because, I mean, don't think that everyone doesn't know uh, what your task truly is on this campaign. Uh, how can you, uh, a, a graduate of Harvard College and the Yale Law School, how can you demean yourself by uh, walking this yappy little dog? And he looks at them and he said, what are you talking about? They, so they, they said, well, you know, don't think that just because there's this, we're in the middle of a driving blizzard that we don't see what you're doing. Uh, what do you call that at the end of your arm? Whereupon the fellow re replies, well, that may look like a dog to you, but to me it looks like an embassy. <laughs> In any case, um, I've got my little ch cheat sheet here. I, I was going to do it on my cuff, but I haven't done that since grade six, which reminds me that I haven't apologized to Mrs. Lewis for, for the last time I wrote this kind of thing on my cuff, so I'm sorry, Mrs. Lewis. But the questions that I'm, all, I'm asked about today, these days, or the past year, relate uh, to the Mideast, uh, September 11th, and, and on both, the question is, what went wrong? And there's always a uh, tone of surprise in the questioners. And partly, I think that's a result of the basic premise in the West that all problems can be solved if people will just be rational and reasonable. Uh, partly, I think it's uh, the decade that we've just gone through, uh, the 90s, where 
the reigning ideology was that markets and uh, globalization would substitute for politics, where uh, we'd reach the end of history. Uh, and uh, it's not a surprise that uh, uh, very few people had <coughs> greeted uh, the, the clash of civilizations, the, the competing metaphor for the decade uh, with uh, much interest. Partly, I think, it's a uh, failure of our media. Uh, this will ensure, Moses, that I don't get a kiss on the cheek when I leave the stage. Uh, we're, you know, television, it's said, uh, expands the mind about 32 inches. Um, commercial television uh, is essentially is a form of uh, entertainment. Even public television. Uh, you know, we all have our biases, of course, with the exception of your four speakers this morning. We all see what we want to see. We report what, what catches our attention. Um, we're seeing today in Canada that ownership matters, uh, that it does influence content, although those of you who've been living in Toronto might have come to that realization reading the Toronto Star over the past 30 years. But partly it's also the fact that uh, governments don't make the mass media's job any easier. You know, all governments uh, spin at a minimum, they evade, they lie. I'm not talking about my career, obviously. But what's been unusual since uh, September 11th is that there's been overt censorship by our governments by North American governments. It's been rather ironic that we're not able to see what Osama bin Laden is saying on the trumped up uh, theory that uh, he may be sending out coded messages in Arabic on Al Jazeera, but that people in the Middle East have full access to this material and uh, we don't get to see what this fellow is saying. Well, he's not a maniac. Uh, within his frame of reference, he's perfectly rational. Uh, he's evoking history that's been going on for hundreds and, thousand, and a thousand years. He's fighting. Uh, we may not think that this is a clash of civilizations. And it's entirely understandable why our leaders would not want to frame it in those terms, just for strategic and propaganda reasons. But he certainly thinks that it's a clash of civilizations. And he and his people are certainly fighting a war that's been going on uh, between Islam and Christianity for a very long time. The, uh, I've never understood, uh, picking up on one of Nellifor's part, uh, uh, points, I've never understood why conservatives, of whom I consider myself one, would shy away from discussing the roots of September 11th. Um, it's one thing, uh, I, I don't, I've never accepted the, the idea that one is justifying the attack of September 11th by trying to understand it. Actions have consequences. U.S. foreign policy has consequences. And I think that uh, we are better off to understand what this is all about. I don't think it's about uh, a fight against terrorism. The uh, attack on the USS Cole in Yemen was not terrorism, at least any definition of terrorism that I understand. Uh, we're not talking about good versus evil, it seems to me. We are talking about uh, a civilizational uh, clash, and, and, and let me be clear that we're not talking about the Islamic world as a homogeneous entity, but we certainly are talking about a large number of people 
who have uh, wheels in their minds that are sufficiently powerful to drive them to commit suicide and to kill large numbers of inno innocent civilians in the process. Now, we in the West have great difficulty understanding how that is possible, but that's what, that's what essentially we are dealing with. So I think the critics of American foreign policy have part of the case right. So the left has it right to a certain degree. Where I think they have it wrong is in understanding the nature of the enemy, uh, in considering this as a criminal, a matter for the criminal law, or for international institutions, or wishing somehow that the lion uh, could lie down with the lamb. As Henry Kissinger once said, that's always possible as long as you change the lamb daily. <laughs> so, just like I think the left got it wrong at the time of the Cold War, and here, Arthur, I think is where we probably disagree. You know, Ronald Reagan was not a genius. Far from it. But there are a lot of people in Eastern Europe who are living in freedom today because someone with simplistic notions felt that the time had come to uh, take down that wall. And fortunately, we had a great leader on the other side in Gorbachev who understood that they had lost and that turning their cannons against their own people was not the way to go. So I take the view that we are in that kind of a clash. It's essentially a clash of ideas. Uh, I don't think we should shy away from affirming our ideas our civilization, our values of human rights, of gender equality, of tolerance, etc., in that clash. But I think that we are in for a very, very long struggle because it takes a long time to change minds, and it's going to take a very, very long time based on my understanding of the Middle East to change these minds. The uh, basic issue in the Middle East is the same issue as Osama bin Laden has been transmitting on Al Jazeera, which we've not been able to see or listen to. And it essentially is that uh, he and his people believe that that part of the world is a wa'af, which means uh, an exclusive trust, and that it's heresy for any non-Muslims to be exercising any sovereignty in that part of the world. He is rebelling against the carving up of that part of the world after World War I, when the Ottoman Empire fell apart. The British and the French divided up that part of the world created new states out of vast territory. The Americans came in rather late. The Americans came in to backfill for the British, which is why they're there and why they are playing the role they are, which again is not a battle against terrorism or good against evil, but is the assertion of U.S. national interests. I don't have any trouble looking that in the, I mean, the Americans, Americans are a funny people. They have to dress up their national interest in moralistic terms. I don't know why, but I guess they have, you know, they have to have nice stories around what they're doing in the world. I don't have any difficulty saying that if I have to choose between the, what Osama bin Laden represents 
and what the Americans represent, I'll choose what the Americans represent, just as I didn't have any trouble and my father didn't have any trouble during the Cold War making that choice. The, the fight in the Middle East is over a territory two-thirds the size of the island where I live, Vancouver Island. Two peoples, both of whom have been there since time immemorial, and therefore have essentially aboriginal claims to that territory. Forget about the metaphor. Palmerston, Palmerston said that metaphors cause, ha inappropriate metaphors cause half the world's problems. Forget about the metaphor of the Middle East as another Algeria. The French were never concerned, the French settlers, the Pieds would ne were never concerned, Pieds Noirs, sorry, were never concerned that they would not have a France to go back to. Forget about the South African model, the uh, League of Nations set up the British mandate over Palestine in part in recognition of the creation of a Jewish state in their terms, recognizing the ancestral link of the Jewish people to their homeland. So forget about the colonial settler metaphors that are very much uh, at play in our media. The only possible solution is to divide up this small territory between two peoples. And if and when reason prevails, that will be the solution. It was the solution that the United, United Nations voted in 1947 to partition that land west of the Jordan River into Palestine and Israel and to create a common market to uh, promote prosperity. Just think about it, 1947, a common market. It remains the only solution today. Unfortunately, a lot of mistakes have been made along the way. You now have two leaders whom I believe are uh, incapable of arriving uh, at peace. Um, it's gonna take a long, long time to change the minds uh, of those people. And the media have a very great degree of difficulty dealing with this conflict. They have a great deal of difficulty uh, dealing with international affairs in general. Reporters come and go. Uh, very few speak the, uh, the languages. There are very few uh, uh, foreign reporters who can go into a madrasa in uh, Pakistan and speak Urdu, or who can go into a mosque in Gaza and speak Arabic. And if I have any advice, uh, particularly uh, given what's going on in the media today, it would be this. Comparison shop. Read as widely as you can in as many languages as you can. Disregard all those pop-up ads on the web. Be skeptical about everything that you're reading. Look for debates uh, such as the email debates that the Globe has introduced. Look for ombudsmen like they have in the Washington Post. Look for columnists who criticize other columnists and uh, try to bring some accountability. It's your only protection. It's your only protection against somebody's ideas becoming wheels in your mind. Thank you very much.